Cleveland Jewish History is a series exploring the fascinating Jewish history of Cleveland, Ohio. One of America's more prominent Jewish communities, Cleveland Jewish History is often unknown and unexplored by many. This series is an attempt to fill that gap. We also hope you'll find it entertaining. Cleveland Jewish History is brought to you through the generous support of Cleveland Jewish Funerals, Cleveland's only Jewish-owned and operated Jewish funeral home. Conveniently located on Miles Road near Orange and Solon, Cleveland Jewish Funerals can assist your family in their time of need. Whether you're Orthodox, Conservative, Reform, or unaffiliated, Cleveland Jewish Funerals will help you plan a dignified memorial that aligns with you and your family's traditions and values. Their experienced and compassionate team can assist your family during an inherently difficult situation. When words fail, the sacred traditions of our ancestors may be the only solace we have. To learn more about pre-planning, contact Community Liaison David Pearl. Learn why pre-planning is a tremendous act of compassion, chesed, for your family. It also helps ensure that your memorial aligns with your values. To learn more, contact David Pearl at 216-340-1400. Additional information is also available at clevelandjewishfunerals.com. The story of Jewish Cleveland is very much a piece of a larger story of Jewish immigration to the United States. During the colonial period, the American Jewish community was very small, perhaps 1,000 to 2,000 individuals. This early Jewish community was largely made up of Sephardi Jewish immigrants who established communities in New York, Savannah, Georgia, Philadelphia, Charleston, South Carolina, and Newport, Rhode Island. In a previous episode, we touched on the history of Sephardi Jewish philanthropist Judah Toro and his contribution to forming Cleveland's second synagogue to Fairth Israel. While Ashkenazi immigrants have long been predominant in Cleveland, the title of Cleveland's first Jewish settler nearly went to a Dutch-born Sephardi Jewish immigrant named Dr. Daniel Levy Maduro Pichotto. Dr. Pichotto took a position as lecturer at the now-defunct Willoughby Medical University in the late 1830s. The medical school operated until 1846, at which time Dr. Pichotto returned to New York City, where he had been living. Had he stayed in Northeast Ohio, he would have earned the title of the first permanent Jewish settler of Cleveland. As mentioned in a previous episode, that title must instead be given to Simpson Thorman, this fur and leather goods dealer from Unsleben, Bavaria, who had laid down roots in the bustling port city and encouraged his townsmen to join him and found a Jewish community. However, the legacy of the Pichotto family in Cleveland was more enduring than the good doctor's temporary sojourn in Northeast Ohio. His son, Benjamin Franklin Pichotto, returned to the area as an adult and had a successful career in oil exploration, making a great deal of money in a city that was at that time the center of the nascent American petroleum industry. Cleveland at this time was the home of John D. Rockefeller, who founded and ran the Cleveland-based Standard Oil Company, at one time the largest company in the world with John D. Rockefeller, later becoming the world's wealthiest man, the Jeff Bezos, or Elon Musk of his era. After making his fortune, Piochotto became a noted journalist for the Cleveland Plain Dealer. He was also a noted lay Jewish communal leader and philanthropist in his own right. And now for a brief excursus. The elder Piochotto's arrival in Northeast Ohio gained the attention of the founder of the Mormon faith, Joseph Smith. At this time, the early Mormon community was in its infancy and centered in Kirtland, Ohio, a short walk from the Willoughby Medical University. There, Joseph Smith led a religious community based on the recently published Book of Mormon, a religious text purporting to contain the writings of ancient prophets who lived on the North American continent from 600 BCE until 421 of the Common Era. The Northeast Ohio period was a critical phase in the growth and development of what would later become the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Joseph Smith and his followers argued that modern Christianity had become corrupt and sought to restore an original apostolic Christianity as represented by Jesus and his early Jewish followers. To that end, Joseph Smith sought to learn Hebrew. He offered Dr. Pichotto a salary in order to serve as Hebrew instructor for his developing religious community. While Dr. Pichotto did not ultimately accept the position, it seems that the Jewish people figured prominently in early Mormon theology. One of Joseph Smith's followers in Kirtland, Orson Hyde, eventually made a trip to Jerusalem where he announced that the time for the Jewish ingathering was at hand. He dedicated a small altar on the Mount of Olives, 
That site is today part of the Brigham Young University Jerusalem Center, overlooking the Temple Mount and the Old City. And now we return to our previously scheduled programming. Between 1820 and 1880, the American Jewish community grew from a few thousand people to approximately a quarter million. During these decades, the overwhelming majority of the recent arrivals hailed from German-speaking lands or regions that were largely defined by German language and culture. And while German culture played a role in the culture of the American Jewish community at the time, calling these immigrants Germans is something of an anachronism. The German Empire wasn't actually founded until 1871. Gentile German-speaking immigrants were a significant part of the American cultural landscape at this time, and German-American Jews did share an affinity for German Kultur. In cities such as Cincinnati, St. Louis, and Milwaukee, German Jews placed an emphasis on preserving the German language amongst themselves and their descendants. This included the publication of German-language Jewish newspapers and the involvement of prominent Jews in various German cultural organizations. In Cleveland, however, the preservation of the German language was never a high priority within the Jewish community. Unlike Cincinnati, for example, Cleveland never supported a German-Jewish newspaper. Prominent German Jews in Cleveland also did not generally take leadership roles in German-American organizations, as they did in other cities such as Milwaukee. Rather, the German-Jewish community placed a premium on acculturation. This meant that English quickly replaced German after the immigrant generation passed from the scene. What really distinguished these German Jews from the later Eastern European arrivals was the desire to modify or reform Jewish prayer, practice, and theology in substantial ways. The implementation of mixed seating, the adoption of organ music during services, the removal of Hebrew from the religious school curriculum, and even moving Shabbat services from Saturday to Sunday were all implemented at one time or another in the German-dominated Reformed congregations of Anche Chesed or Tefereth Israel, today's Fairmount Temple and the Temple Tefereth Israel. Cleveland's first Jewish institutions were all founded by German Jews. This included the aforementioned synagogues, the Willett Street Cemetery, and later the Jewish Orphan Asylum founded in 1868, and the Kesher Home for Aged and Infirm Israelites built in 1882. The Jewish Orphan Asylum and the Kesher Home would both be built in the Woodland neighborhood. From mid-19th century until the 1920s, Woodland remained a major center of Jewish life in Cleveland, especially near the East 55th Street Corridor. The Jewish Orphan Asylum maintained an impressive seven-acre campus at Woodland and East 51st. It would later move to University Heights in 1929 and be renamed Belfair. The Kesher Home would also change its name to the Montefiore Home, and moved to Cleveland Heights in 1917. In 1880, the Jewish community of Cleveland numbered 3,500 and primarily came from German-speaking lands. After 1880, a major wave of Eastern European Jewish immigration began to arrive on America's shores. These harassed and harried immigrants were fleeing discrimination and frequent outbreaks of mob violence in the Russian Empire. Jews of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, while not persecuted to the same degree, also arrived in the United States to seek economic opportunity and religious freedom. The Jewish population of Cleveland grew to 30,000 in 1905, 60,000 in 1912, and 90,000 in 1920, essentially the size of Cleveland's Jewish community today. These Yiddish-speaking Jewish immigrants were very different in many regards from their German-speaking predecessors. The Eastern European migrants were traditional in religious practice and outlook. One of the hallmarks of the Cleveland Jewish community was the obvious alienation felt by the new arrivals towards the practices of their more established Reformed brethren. These immigrants settled in the Central Market area and moved eastward down Woodland and Scoville Avenues. The German Jews lived reasonably close to their Eastern European brethren, but always seemed to settle just east of their co-religionists. First to Case Avenue, a newer district in the Woodland neighborhood, then on to Glenville, and eventually to Cleveland Heights. This has been the established pattern of Jewish life in Cleveland. More assimilationist-oriented Jews would pioneer neighborhoods to the east, and their more traditionally-minded brethren would then follow suit shortly afterwards. From Central to Woodland, then on to Glenville, Cleveland Heights, Shaker Heights, and University Heights. Later on, Sheikh Hesed Fairmount Temple would construct an impressive campus in Beechwood, whose then predominantly Gentile residents objected to what they perceived to be a major influx of Jews into what was still at the time a semi-rural village. By 1920, Woodland was still largely an immigrant Jewish neighborhood, albeit with large Italian and other ethnic groups present in substantial numbers. The African American community would only begin to migrate to Woodland in large numbers during the 1920s. One of the early African American students to live in the neighborhood was Langston Hughes, 
When he attended Central High School in 1916, many of his fellow students were Jewish. Woodland Avenue had at one time been a somewhat affluent boulevard filled with substantial homes. As wealthier residents migrated eastward, those larger homes were subdivided and became multifamily dwellings, often housing poor immigrant families and later African Americans migrating from the south. At the turn of the century, the wide tree-lined street was filled with Jewish peddlers and their pushcarts. Farmers cried their wares, and Yiddish-speaking peddlers sold all manner of goods. Woodland was a densely populated urban neighborhood, and immigrant Jews would often make their way to factory work in Cleveland's garment industry. There, Jewish workers from Eastern Europe would work at clothing factories largely owned by other Jews. A very large share of the workforce, although probably not a majority, were Jews. Other immigrant groups included Slovenians, Italians, Poles, Ukrainians, and others. Until the Great Depression, Cleveland was the nation's second largest center for the garment industry after New York. The Jewish-owned factories producing ready-to-wear clothing included Joseph and Feiss, H. Black and Company, Richmond Brothers, and Bobby Brooks. Some employers, such as Richmond Brothers, were well known for their progressive attitudes towards employee relations. Company executives were expected to greet employees by name. Employee birthdays were recognized, and there were no time clocks. It was the first factory in the United States to grant employees two weeks paid vacation, later extended to three weeks. It offered benefits such as health care, and even offered employees no interest loans. At 650,000 square feet of factory space, Richmond Brothers was at one time the largest manufacturer of men's clothing in the world. However, the industry began to decline somewhat after its peak in 1911. At this time, Cleveland's garment industry was nearly on par with that of New York. However, most factories did not provide the same employee benefits as Richmond Brothers. In June of 1911, more than 5,000 garment workers, the majority of whom were Jewish, went on strike against 34 local Jewish-owned garment factories. The strikers demanded a 55-hour work week, higher wages, and no Sunday work. Eventually, the protests degenerated into violence, arrests, and clashes with police. Some of the owners hired strike breakers, derogatorily referred to as scabs, who were housed in on-site dormitories in order to avoid the increasingly violent scenes at the factory gates. Ultimately, this little-known footnote in American labor history ended in defeat for the strikers and owners. Cleveland's garment manufacturers lost significant market share to the industry in New York. The Great Depression also damaged the industry and Cleveland's garment industry began its inexorable decline. A notable holdout was the Richmond Brothers Company. It managed to stay in business for an impressive 113 years before finally closing in 1992. The firm had survived labor struggles, cutthroat competition, and changes in men's fashions since its founding by Henry Richmond in 1879. However, it could not survive the offshoring of American jobs to developing countries. Like virtually the entire American textile industry, jobs were shipped overseas in search of lower wages. The Woodland neighborhood retained a distinctly traditional and working-class Jewish character until the 1920s. The Jewish Carpenters Union in Cleveland certainly advocated on behalf of the Jewish working classes. However, unlike other, more socialist-oriented unions, the Jewish Carpenters Union had a pronounced religious streak. In the Woodland neighborhood, many of the carpenters were affiliated with the Orthodox Obsetic Congregation, now known as Taylor Road Synagogue. Meetings were often held at the synagogue, dietary and Sabbath laws were observed at all meetings, and the union received the explicit backing of many of the Orthodox rabbis of the city. This picture shows the assembled Jewish carpenters dressed in white overalls as they prepared to march from Congregation Oheb Tzedek on Labor Day in 1911. Politically, the Woodland neighborhood was dominated by Republican Party politics at the turn of the 20th century. Its most prominent figure was Republican ward leader and Cleveland City Councilman Harry Bernstein. He owned the Perry Street Theater, a Yiddish language theater popular amongst immigrants. Yiddish drama, vaudeville, and early motion pictures were shown there. Bernstein was known as the Tsar of Woodland Avenue. He was known as the immigrant's friend and was known to help immigrants navigate the English-speaking bureaucracy or get out of legal trouble if necessary. He also provided periodic financial assistance to those in need, on the condition that his new friends vote Republican. As the Woodland District began to lose its Jewish residents and become increasingly African American, the Tsar's influence began to wane. However, his protege, Morris Matchke, was chairman of the Cuyahoga County Republican Party. He was instrumental in the nomination and election of Ohio native Warren G. Harding to the American presidency in 1921, reflecting Cleveland's outsized influence in Ohio and the nation at large. 
Today, many Jewish Clevelanders are unaware of the role of the Woodland neighborhood in Cleveland Jewish history. Unfortunately, this now benighted district is one of the most impoverished and crime-filled in the city. So much so that many seek to avoid driving through there if they can. But for the intrepid Jewish observer, the district is still filled with remnants of Cleveland's Jewish past. Some of the buildings are modest and others are quite simply sublime. But they are all glimpses of our community as it existed more than a century ago. Cleveland Jewish History has been brought to you through the generous support of Cleveland Jewish Funerals, Cleveland's only Jewish-owned and operated Jewish funeral home. To learn more, contact Community Liaison David Pearl at 216-340-1400 and clevelandjewishfunerals.com. Stay tuned for additional content covering the always interesting and sometimes fascinating Jewish history of Cleveland, Ohio.